this lecture and the next lecture is devoted to the psychic reading, uh, also called the cold reading, and it's done deliberately by someone who knows what they're doing. Um, who's aware that, uh, that this is a tool, a technique, that's exploiting the limitations or the uh, biases of the human mind and taking advantage of it. I like the psychic reading, being a skeptic, so and I think it's the, and being a person who uh, wrote uh, the major chapter in the annual review, I wrote a chapter, the only time they ever had it, uh, in the annual reviews of psychology on the psychology of deception. And as a psychologist, I would say my specialist was the psychology of deception. And to me, the cold reading, uh, of the psychic reading, represents a prototype, a, a good example that contains everything that we want to talk about, or why, how people believe, how powerful it is, the, how vividness, uh, how the power of a story about and how dealing with yourself can override everything else and create a reality. It's very, very powerful and I find this a very good thing to use to understand how the mind works and doesn't work and what motivates us, what gets us excited and so on. And uh, so what we're going to do now, uh, this reading, this lecture will be mostly on giving you samples of readings, a lot by myself, but I also got Randy in here. And um, then, uh, if we have time, uh, this lecture, we're going to give you a little thing I do uh, in my workshops. I, I'm going to pair you off. Hopefully, when I pair you off, I'm going to try, I, you probably know each other a lot, but try and get you match, match you up with people you least know, so you're more effective that way. And I'm going to teach you how to read, give each other a reading. I'm going to teach you what I call a systematic scan, and uh, it's very powerful. I've, I've done it over and over again, so I know by experience that this works. I did it recently at the workshop on cold reading at the TAM last year, and uh, we had uh, 130 people in that room, as big as I've ever had, because I always liked the small group. We paired everyone off, and uh, the average accuracy rating that people gave each other's readings was 85%. <laughs> By the way, that's a magic number because that over the last 20 years of my doing these workshops is about the average accuracy rating I get is about 85 percent. So that's about, uh, so you, that's a little better than you're going to do, than the ordinary psychics do. So just after this one little reading, you're going to be better than most psychics. Okay, so let's start off with some examples. Um, uh, let's start off with the superpower show, okay? This, that was a show done in, uh, in Britain on, on one of the channels there in 1990. Um, and um, I want to show you a segment uh, where they had me come there on that show because they have a man in England called Christian Dion. Well, you'll see it. Let's see. Let's talk for himself. Go show that. John, Christian's here with the tarot cards. If you want Christian to have a look at the future, 071-603-1152. So get darling now for that. Okay, well, the phones are buzzing and Florence is in Ilford. Um, as we pick out the cards, there's, t there's two things, particularly going back... Ray Hyman is on the Executive Council of Psychop. He's listening to tapes of English psychic Christian Dion's radio talk show, sent to him in America by a British associate. In the show, Dion questions callers and gives them psychic readings and advice. London Talkback Radio. Hyman came over to London to investigate. Hi, everyone. All right. How are you? Fine. Shuffling yeah. going on? Shuffle around, is yeah. yeah, I, Well, I think people don't actually believe it. I shuffle them all the time and change them around, but we do, kids. We do. Certainly do. Um, what? Over the, over the last, sort of, basically 12 years, it's been a bit of a dodgy patch, Yvonne. That's all right. And I feel that you have also been, um, been draining yourself a lot recently. Mm. You've been getting yourself all wound up. Yes. Very, very much so. And if, without being rude, you've lost your sparkle. That's right. You know, it's like you're not you at the minute. It's the, some, you, you, we need to get your sparkle back. I think that will 
be better as we go into the old. It's a bit like being able to view a videotape of someone's life. You can see the past, the present time, the future time, which gives them evidence, if you want, that you, things you're predicting for the future are good, or at least accurate. Right. Is there anything particularly you wanted to find out about? It just helps him pick up on things. Right. Stay on the line. We're with you soon. If you can just make sure your radio is turned off, you've hit down the line. Well, what do Dion's callers think? Is Yvonne from Acton convinced of his psychic powers? Yvonne, you just had a consultation with Christian Dion. What do you think of Christian? I thought he was good. It was right what he said to me. What were some of the things that he said? That well, was he said there was ups and downs in the last 12 years, and um, in the last two, and also that I tend to put everybody else before myself, and I've lost my sparkle. You know, that was all. And he said about a property deal, which I take it he means moving between now and Easter next year. Is that something you have, have been thinking Well, about? we have, yeah. Um, and he seems to think that it will happen. She's just one person. And many, many thousands of people are seem to be just as convinced as she is. And the sad thing is that there are alternative explanations. Today on News Radio Back in Buffalo, Hyman is going to show how to read people's minds without psychic powers. 24 minutes after 10 o'clock, my guest in studio, Mr. X, a psychic reader, a gentleman who is able to tell you many things intuitively about yourself uh, through the use of his ability to focus in on your psychic energy and also with the use of tarot cards, which he has in front of them now. Good morning, Julie. Good morning. How are you? Fine, thank you. And you? Good. You sound very chipper and very happy. So <laughs> uh, I also see that you've had um, probably some daydreams only. It's a just really fantasy daydream type of thing uh, where you, you even thought of maybe running away once in a while and maybe even starting life anew with a new relationship and so on. But that's just because of this problem of as you begin to think of uh, the youth that's now slipping by and facing the future. Oh, good. And that, mm. that part of it's taken care of. Well, that was remarkably accurate. I, I compliment you on that. Thank you, you now. Bye-bye. Cold reading well, is when we you a meet a client right whom you've never met before. We call it meeting them cold. And give them a reading that is insightful, and the client thinks is gets to the core of his or her personality. And the way this is achieved, in a nutshell, is to give the client general statements that could apply to anyone, but then you gradually refine them by the feedback you get from the client. And once you get this feedback and refine it, you make sure that the message, whole message is wrapped up with this uh, rule. The basic rule is you tell them what they want to hear. Now let me give you an example of what is like a cold reading. Let me show you what Christian Dion was doing, just a little sample from him. This year to Easter of next year, before you're able to get the property matter completely organized. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean to say it's gonna take the whole of that time, it's in that time. We, what, did you say property matters? Property matters. What do you mean by that? Well, because around you property-wise, it's as though there's no settlement at the moment. Yeah. He's talking about this property matter, and he, he said it's not necessarily that during that time, but in this time, which actually, if you think about it, covers quite an, a big range, There's a group, big range of things there. The next five-year block... You could break sure down his whole approach to a simple formula, which I think would be very easy to write on a computer. And the reason you can do this, by the way, is that it's not Christian Dion who, who makes these readings so successful. It's the people who are listening. They are putting the meaning in there. Um, I haven't actually got a partner. At all? Um... No, not, not in that way, no. And I'm talking romantically, obviously. No. Right. At all? No, nobody. All not right. romantically, no. All right, well, let that one ride. I couldn't agree with them more in the saying that anybody can do what I do, because we all have the power. It's just that they haven't, A, got the uh, logic, if they want to use that word, to see that we don't tell them general things anyway. When people come for readings, very specific things. And if uh, I was telling people general things, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing, because people wouldn't come and see me. So the skeptics have got the problem, not myself. About 97% is my estimation of people who do psychic readings believe in what they're doing. Even though if you listen to them over and over again, they have a very simple formula, very repetitive. Do you want to hear an honest answer? I yeah. think they're thick. 
I honestly think they are thick. I mean, do you think it's some, they feel a challenge to their personal I think they, systems? well, maybe they have a challenge to the belief systems as we all have, but I think they're basically inadequate and they are thick. I mean, they've tried it before, no doubt they'll attack me after that, and they'll try it again, but good luck to them. She'll always work because she's completely dedicated. I would like anyway, without further ado, to introduce you to this remarkable medium, this wonderful sensitive, Doris Collins. Doris Collins is Britain's most famous medium and healer. And not surprisingly, she hasn't escaped psycho... Doris Collins, well, I will say something about Doris Collins. She was at that time um, the top medium in England. Is that Doris Stokes or Doris Collins? Doris Collins. And uh, uh, a guy named... Um, I'm trying to think of his name. He had a talk show uh, on PBS all the time. He was very famous for a while. And then he, uh, oh boy, I wish I could think of his name. <laughs> I'm so bad at it. But anyways, you know, some of you would recognize his name. But anyways, he was uh, had a talk show, um, and he brought her to the United States because she's so famous in England. And one of the things she does, she stands up in front of a crowd. She proceeded well, well, many years before there was a John Edwin stuff doing the same stuff. But she would stand in front of the crowd in England and say, I get an, uh, uh, an abbot, uh, a name abbot, uh, does anyone recognize the name abbot, and stuff like that, because someone would, and so on. Uh, he brought her to the United States and had her on his show, and she bombed completely. No recognized names she's thrown out. And the problem was that all the names she throws out are standard names in England, and they're not the standard names in this country. Oh, no. Another thing that's like that, uh, there's a guy named George Alexander, who became the, uh, who was the predecessor of John Edward and all the, and Van Prague, they all, they're just copying him. They're, they're poor imitations of John Anderson. But John Anderson had the, had it down to, 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 to uh, the, the, the things they had. He, they had it down to a very simple form. Again, I could write a program for her. And I was on uh, Larry King Live opposite George Anderson one year, Larry King wasn't on that show. There was a, he was away and there was a substitute, Mary something or other, I forget her name. So she was the hostess of the show. And we were in, I went to San Francisco and George Anderson at that time had a radio show and he was very, had a book out. He's still alive on the, and you can see him on the internet. He still runs his stuff, but he was a big deal at that time. He was the medium to talk to people. And he, I think he's the guy who began to develop what I would call a modern approach to doing readings uh, for mediums. But uh, his approach was simple. He would say, uh, someone would call in, usually he did this on radio all the time, but sometimes on TV too, someone would call in and he'd say, I get a name like Jonathan, Jonathan. Does that name mean anything to you? And if they say yes, he, he would then say, living or dead? <laughs> if, they, if they said dead, then it said, Jonathan was trying to reach you. This is a message from Jonathan to you. If they say, living, okay, there's a spirit out here trying to reach Jonathan. Oh. And then he got on stuff. That was, his, that, was all, that was the basis of his thing. Okay, so he's on, I'm supposed to be the, um, the poo-poo guy, uh, you know, the party pooper. Uh, uh, anyway, um, I'm on, and Anderson gets the first call. Uh, someone calls, and it's obviously an elderly lady, you can tell from her voice. And he says, I get the name John. Do you know John? She hesitates and she says, no. And she says, no, John, don't you ever have a John in your life? She says, no. And then he says, oh, I see, the static in the air. Uh, it's, 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 it's Joe, Joseph. Did you know Joe or Joseph? No. Oh, no. I'm saying, yeah, boy, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> And she went, he went through, uh, oh, it's, it's Jill, it's Jillian, that's what, you know, the static is pretty bad on the other side. And, uh, and she knows, she didn't know Jillian at all. And he went through a few more, and it just was a big bust, she didn't know anything. Uh, and it, it, later on my way back to Eugene from San Francisco, it dawned on me, you know, she's calling from New Mexico, it said, from Mexico, she's probably on the reservation. <laughs> And they don't have any names like Joe, Jillian, and stuff like that, but which, which he gets away with all the time because they're standard names, right? And he can transform them. And you know, the, again, uh, uh, John Edwards has taken over that thing. He throws out the name, and it, it's, it's not Jack, it's John, not Jack, John, okay, it's, it's, it's uh, Joseph, and so on. 
And it's, it's always something as simple as that. It works, though. It works. This guy's a millionaire now, right? And uh, so don't knock it. But uh, She doesn't know it, but the reader, who's a University of Oregon psychology professor, says palm reading is pure fiction. And Diana doesn't believe in it herself. But something strange is about to happen. Diana is going to become a believer. You have a hard time hanging on to money. You have uh, spaces between your fingers. Oh. And Ray Hyman gently raises common topics like money or career on the lookout for giveaway responses. A nod here or a word there. Let other people do your income tax. Okay. Uh, otherwise, do. Uh, you do. Okay, do. good. Uh, the fate line comes very late, very, very late out of your lifeline. And that suggests your career is very, very late in coming. This is children, you know, and lots of them are there. After about 20 minutes, Ray is feeding back to Diana what he's gathered she probably wants to hear. Six. Jeez, I better hurry. How accurate was it? Uh, pretty accurate. Really? Yeah. The uh, career, um, about four years ago, I started selling insurance and have just now decided that it's really not what I want to do. Kids, of course, I have one child, but my mother has five. My sister has five. So now Diana thinks three. there might be something to and this. I think I was really meant to have more children, but I never married young. And then uh, when he said accounting and stuff, he's right. I, I'm not a bookkeeper. I don't want to be. And I let other people handle my taxes and, and everything. She and I are working as a team. Yeah. Uh, we, I call it a symbiotic relationship. She wants me to be right because you know, it's going to could help her. And of course, I want to be right because it's an ego trip for me as a reader. Uh, and so we're helping each other. So was there a point during this where you said to yourself, oh, this guy ha has some ability? Yes. Now what about now, now that you know that he doesn't believe in it, that he's just reading what you told him, how do you feel about the future? How do you feel about the things he told you about the future? Well, uh, pretty much the same except that I'm going to, uh, it's nice to know that I have a big strong marriage line there. This is really interesting. You're thinking about the things he told you and you're considering them and you're reconsidering <laughs> your life in a way, even though uh, he, he Doesn't it was like a, a put up job. I think that I was taking the stuff that I believe uh, I want to happen to be true. Most of us look at the world in the same way as Diana. We pick the bits of a horoscope we like and read them into the stars. The rest of the show had me, the reason he came to, to Eugene, he wanted me to test a dowser. And we did, I, we set up a test of a dowser, we tested this dowser. He was a nice guy and he wanted to be tested and I was able to, uh, and I used Barry Byerstein to help me and we went to the fairgrounds because we, he, he doused, he had to have a place that was going to be no electric wires around and stuff like that. So we went to the fairgrounds and we, um, uh, did a nice test of the dowser. He said he could locate metal under under a bucket. So he had ten buckets, and we very strong. Double double blind. Barry Biasin would place the thing according to a random schedule under one of the ten buckets, and then mix the buckets a little bit so that they you couldn't tell that one had been handled. While Alan Alda and I and the dowser were away, and then we would come back, and that Barry regarded the way because so. He knew where it was, and he couldn't inadvertently give us any clues. And the Dows would use his rod to find the object we placed under one of the buckets. And he, he, just, he just flat out was bad at it. He, even though this was his test, he suggested. It was very bad. And Alan Alda was a very nice guy, and you could see he was puzzled by this gal here because she was inconsistent. And afterwards, by the there's more that goes on, you know, but they caught a lot of the, lot of the important things on this thing here. She was... Uh, adamant that she didn't believe any of this stuff, but she was also adamant that I told her things that no one could have known by normal means. And she insisted on both. And Alan was puzzled. He was trying to get her. Do you see the contradiction in it? She didn't see any contradiction. She doesn't believe this stuff at all, but he knows stuff that no one could have known by any normal means. And he told me that, and he was right on everything. So it was very puzzling. Well, well a similar th another thing happened with this dowser. After he failed everything, we got into the van to drive back to the university because we were doing most of the uh, show from the university. Um, as we were driving back, Alan asked the dowser, he said, look, you were so sure of this before you went into this, and yet you bombed. 
How do you explain that? So he said, well, I don't blame Professor Hyman. I don't blame any of you. Uh, Hyman, Professor Hyman was very nice. He did everything uh, that he said he was going to do, and he fulfilled, fulfilled all my conditions. He says, but I think the problem is that science hasn't caught up with us yet. <laughs> And suddenly come across that, but I'd love that because he said that. And Alan said, "What do you mean by that?" He said, "Well, well uh, science is not ready to to detect what I do. You know, then it's not ready. So we're too far. We're how far ahead of science? So I, I love that. Anyway, it gets louder. I think later. I don't know. I think what we should do now is go uh, forward some more to, because uh, near the end of the show it gets much in more interesting, because at the first half of the show it's all positive. It, it seems like he's hitting with that group and everything else, but later you find something else at the end of the show. This is Gary Schwartz, who I had some very strange interactions with. But he, he validates Edward, among others. He's a professor at, um, that's, uh, uh, Joe does a very good job on the show. Died of heart attack, he was on the boat tub, and there was someone else in the room with him, and there was a lot of suspicious circumstances around him. So John Edward did hone in on a suspicious death. But what if we could have a snapshot of all the people John Edward said were clamoring <coughs> to send a message to the living? What kind of people would we find they are? Well, they're not angry folks. They're not bitter about being taken too soon. We heard no stories of pain and suffering, no calls for revenge or settling of scores. These dead people are nice, and they really boring. But as we saw here, even a nice, boring word from the dead beats a whole sermon from anybody in this world. She's making me feel that you have developed spiritually, like you're opening up more and more to this. These two people are coming through, just graduating with a baby. And she's making me feel like there's something with real estate or investments that come up around you that you're going to be getting involved with. Still. Something else happened that night in the group readings. A departed family member does seem to come through loud and clear. Hold on. Did something look like Anthony? Are you waiting like that's me? That's it? Really? For, of all people, they find cameraman Tony Pagano, one of two cameramen shooting our story. John Edwards zeroes in on the fact that Tony's father has died. Do you not see that for a Had you been away before I had the distance? Yeah, I was in a while because he's making me feel like he needs to move past this. Was he Yankees fan? <laughs> no, he died again if you're that. And he's telling me to acknowledge. <laughs> he found the ring. I don't know what this means. Well, I had a ring that was given to me. I only wore one piece of jewelry beside my wedding ring. And when my dad died, the last time I saw him in the coffin, I took that ring off and put it on his hand. He said some things that were very personal that only I knew. Um, and putting the ring on his finger, on my dad's finger, when he died was really something that I don't think anyone else saw. When you watch a lot of these readings, ring, photo, dog, these things come up over and over, and you're almost sure to get a hit. I mean, I have like maybe a dozen 
memories involved in the reading and so on. In fact, jewelry did come up several times during this group reading. Lost the in the ring. Their mom ring. The main thing that they talk about the bracelet or the watch is a bracelet or watch connection that comes up with this. There was a lot of talk of special months. Yes. I want to talk to you and I want to talk to you about either the 10th, which either means that it's in October, the month of October, or the 10th of the month having some type of meeting. But she's going to definitely talk about April. She's showing me April. Who's your business? Mine. And of course, how people <laughs> die. Cancer and heart disease are the two major causes of death. We'll hear a lot about that. Imagine somebody passes from cancer, also there, because they're showing me cancer. Some type of congestion that comes up in the chest. So either somebody had congestive heart failure, pneumonia, or they could not breathe, because there's a problem that comes up in this area. And who passed from breast cancer? But John Edward also came up with specific information. These people, it seemed right on target. Is there anybody with a unique S name? Does anybody have more than unique skins, like when they have prickly skin, like psoriasis? Who is this? Yeah, yeah. No, it's Daisy Peasy. My name sounds like psoriasis. It's a lie. What did you find? Ah! Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Okay. That's for you. This is coming through. Tell me the connection to the twins. For the twins? Yes? You understand this? Okay. Who are the twins? Uh, my daughters and granddaughters. Our twins? Both of them. Okay. And he was right about our cameraman Tony's father. Anthony. He had passed away. We got Anthony. That's pretty good, yeah. Anthony. We've seen mediums who mill about before sessions and read people and chat with them and pick up things. John Edward had made it a point to avoid any contact <coughs> before that night's session. But remember this footage of Edward dancing? Tony was the cameraman and shot this just hours before the group reading. You met Tony before, though, right? Early that day? Yeah. They not only met, but Tony told John Edward a critical piece of information during the shoot. It's focused. Were you aware of what your dad had done before you did this reading? I think earlier in the day he had said something. And it makes me feel like, you know, that's fairly significant. <laughs> <laughs> What is the skepticism? What 
what could he possibly be doing that they have some fault to say about it? Because the dead are not here to dispute the matter, not to us anyway. We are quite literally left with the words of John Edward and the faces of the people who hang on his every word for some glimpse of a hereafter, believing there must be something else. Their loved ones have gone on. For them, if not for others, it is enough. When you bury someone and you put the date of their death on the... Uh, you get the idea a little bit. Uh, in the... Um, manual that I gave out for cold reading, which J, uh, JREF may make available so that uh, people want to get a copy of it. It's about 85 to 100 pages long. It's a manual which I hope covers everything you need to know about cold reading. I did take off the internet a long transcript of, uh, of Ed John, James Edward on uh, Larry King Live Show. The value of taking it off the Larry King Live Show or a show like this is that it's not edited. On his own show, sci-fi show, it's always edited. They leave out all the misses and stuff like that. It's very carefully edited, uh, which means that you can't make any judgments at all. And um, on this long one, uh, it's the, 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 there, there's a person who has some website and he makes comments on, on, on various points that during the transcript of Evans giving a reading uh, on Larry King Live Show, and it's a long thing. So I put the whole transcript on that uh, in the appendix because you just have to read it to see what's going on. Uh, every single reading Edwards does like that that's unedited is he's throwing out names. He says, I get a H, a Harry, like a name like Harry. Does that make sense to you? And again, living or dead, almost like the George Anderson technique. And if it's living, then the message is for that person. If it's dead, that person giving a message to the caller. And um, it's always a very common name. It's always a first name, never a last name. Think about it. And there's a few simple rules about that goes on there. And also, many times, even with the common names that he's using this technique, there are people who say no. I don't know anyone, anyone any, I'm close to anyone by the name of John, and I don't have, know anyone who's passed on who's named John. Uh, Edward doesn't back down, and this is his other technique. He says, look, I am always right. The spirits never lie. You go back and check, and you'll find it out. Uh, and and uh, this, he does this a lot, too. So he browbeats him, so he never admits defeat. And he can't lose that way. It's all, it's all he does. It, that's, it's much less technique. There's no technique at all, actually, where I look at it, except for those simple rules. He just throws out names at random, and they're very common. And um, he uh, doesn't have any technique at all. If you took my course from me about one of my workshops, or you just read my manual, you'll be better, you have better technique than he has, but he doesn't need it. Just like Gail doesn't need technique in bending spoons. He doesn't need it. Apparently, it's just enough to people calling in, like this lady there you just saw. They're getting comfort. They want to believe in him, and he doesn't have to have any technique at all. He's, he's home free. He's a millionaire. He's going to keep making money at it, and uh, he can't lose. So no matter how bad you are at it, this stuff works. And uh, that's the message we want to get there. Now, uh, how many here have had a reading from a psychic? Uh, okay, and did you find it impressive or any kind? Wendy, how was yours? What's that? Uh, it was Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and he, and oh, it was he, Mark. Yeah. Mark Edward, yeah. Mark yeah. Edward. And I knew better. And the guy <laughs> is just a natural psychologist. And yeah. I knew that I was giving meaning to what he was saying to me. And I also know that he knows me and he knows me. Okay, so she's, she's know, saying so she's got a double yeah. whammy. You know, it was, she, she's a skeptic, and she's saying uh, that, I, I got to say this because sure. people aren't hearing you. I won't hear you on the line. Okay. Uh, and she's saying that Mark Edward uh, gave her a reading, and uh, she knows uh, that, you know, she doesn't believe this is real and stuff like that, yet still was impressive. He's a good psychologist, and she was impressed by it. Okay, now how much time do we have? We have about 25 minutes. Okay, I think we'll try it then. We're going to have you, I'm going to have you, I'll peel off, with, uh, find someone that hopefully that you don't know too well, but we're going to peel you off. Let's see, two, four, 
hopefully it's an even number, we'll find if it's an even number. And we're gonna have you, I'm gonna give you a, a technique for reading each, each other, okay? And it'll work, uh, no question about it. So it, don't, you believe in it. So I'm gonna give you this, so, so if you pair up, uh, sometimes you may have to move your chairs and then you can move back later. And just say it's facing each other, that would be nice. We're gonna use what I call a systematic scan. There are many techniques you can use uh, to do a thing, but this thing is, uh, believe me, it's very powerful and it should work very well. What you're gonna do is, uh, you're gonna, we're gonna do it systematically. Uh, later, if you get, if you practice it, you won't have to do it systematically. You just sit and look at people, you can do it. But we're gonna have, I'm gonna have you look, we're gonna do it systematically. I'm gonna have you first look at the person's hair that, that's opposite you. Okay. Their hair, look at their hair. And, and, and see anything that comes to mind that, 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 that the hair might say something to you about it. Now, for example, is this well-kept hair? Is it not well-kept? Does it hair try to make, to make a statement? Is it natural color? Is there any hair? Right. You know, uh, okay. Like now, 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 don't worry. <laughs> now, the most, okay, the most important thing is not to worry. If nothing comes to you, fine, forget about it. That's okay. But if something comes to you, just remember it. If some, something, what kind of a person would they have a hair like that? Did they take care of it? Uh, or they didn't take care of it? Is it, is it casual? Is it, is it, is it well-groomed? Is it natural? You know, whatever. If nothing comes to you, fine. That's okay. Don't worry. Okay, so after you've done that, and by the way, it's good to take notes. Yeah, if you can take notes, it'll help. Uh, write something down. If not, if nothing comes to you from that, that's okay, because you're gonna have a lot of, a lot of opportunity. You don't need much. Just now look at their face. Now, uh, just look at the face, and for example, is there acne or any marks like that that might say something to you or not? Uh, is there makeup on? If there's not no makeup on, if there's makeup, is it more than it should be for this occasion, or is it less, or is it well, well in good taste? Uh, Anything you tell you, is the face too, suggests it's too puffy or overweight, anything at all. If nothing, fine, don't worry about it. You have lots of opportunity to get other stuff. Uh, okay, and we're gonna go relatively fast because you don't need much time on these kinds of things as, and you get better at it, you can do it automatically. Uh, now, uh, the next thing is, look at the person's body, upper body especially, and uh, how are they seated? Uh, are they good good posture? Are they relaxed? Bad posture? Uh, okay. Okay. Bad posture. Uh, anything about their body? Are they slouching? At this point, also, you might make a consideration: Are they overweight? Underweight? Uh, they look like someone who spends time in the gym a lot. Are they, are they spend too much time in the pizza parlor? You know, whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, also, it's the time to begin looking at their clothing a little bit too. What kind of clothing do they have on? Is it, uh, again, is it casual? Is it studied? Is it um, uh, uh, anything that it tells you about it? Is it um, uh, are they making a statement with their clothing or are they, um, you know, anything at, at all. Now you can go, go on and look at the legs and, uh, and the rest of the body all the way, and, and see again, uh, uh, anything that tells you there about their pants, what, how their legs are covered, anything that tells you about that. And uh, very important, the shoes. The shoes match the socks. Uh, are they, are they, do they have socks? Uh, and uh, are the shoes tell you something? Are they casual shoes? Are they uh, shoes for, it uh, used to be, you can't tell now, but there are shoes, there used to be, you could tell that people have some problems with their feet, the kind of, kind of shoes they had, were wearing, but you can't tell these days about that kind of stuff. But, but shoes can tell you a lot, especially, are they, do they clash? Are they, they fit in with everything else? Where they going? What's that? Forest Gump. I'm sorry? Forest Shoes tell you a lot about Oh, okay, okay. Where Fine, okay. Now, uh, Look for any jewelry or any kind of jewelry. You look at the hands especially and see if there's any jewelry. Of course, marriage rings are there, but sometimes when you're reading someone, you will see that they don't have a marriage ring, but it looks like that there's a place where a marriage ring was. 
And you, you know, that tells you a lot many times. It used to tell me a lot when I was doing readings that they took it off deliberately to, 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 to hide the fact that they're married. Once you were, I pick it up. And you would see, you can often see because they've been in the sun or something like that, there's a white blue place where the ring was. They've taken it off. They've probably taken it off just before the reading to uh, challenge me in some way. But uh, anyways, you look for little signs like that. Sometimes you get, it, t- it gives you a lot, sometimes it tells you nothing. But you're looking for things like that. Fingernails are very important, so check them out. You know, they're you know, people who bite their fingernails, people take care of their fingernails. Uh, they long, un- you know, it, it can tell you things or not. Yeah, would you say the person is laid back or uh, tense or um, this is very important, their posture. Uh, is it good posture or not good posture? Hmm. And anything like that that you can say about it. I think you have enough now. I think you have enough to, now one thing it helps that you got a lot of what I would call descriptors. And now the thing is to put them into a story, to make a story out of it. And uh, when I was uh, uh, playing with Christian Dion, you know, trying to simulate him, uh, he always, everything he did, he put, he had three places. He put some stuff in the past, what the immediate past or the recent past has before this person called or they encountered this person, and things that could lead up to any problems they now have, uh, and then the present, what the situation is present, and the f- immediate future and the long-range future. Now, a safe thing to tell people, well, we'll get to that later. Uh, I'm going to let you stop at this. But sometimes it's good to put what you have into a story or some sort of a framework or context. You don't have to, but it's good. OK, now we're finished. You're all set. And uh, I'm going to have, uh, wh- would you mind, to, to mind being willing to op- openly tell what you come up with? We give you, would you give his, him his reading now? I'll, I'll just tell him. G- give him a, yeah, tell, tell him what you think he's like, what, what kind of person he is, and so on. What, what did you come up with? Now, this is a really good comparison. These are really different people from different worlds, right? Well, I guess. Okay, well, different age levels and so on, right? Uh, you're older than she is, right? Okay. Who do you want to go first? Who should go first? Um, okay. okay, you have a wide variety of tastes. Um, you're pretty laid back. Um, I think I had a couple others, but I think I've forgotten them now. And what what notes did you write um, Just, just n- not things I heard, just about the systematic scan thing. So. Okay, that's good enough so far. How far, how is what, he's, what Louis said, how, how, how is it, how, what would you say? Say about um, How did it fit you? It fit me pretty well. Fit you well. How, you, you gave it a rating from zero to 100. What would you give it? Uh, 100. 100? Yeah. Okay. I only said two things. Okay, well, <laughs> you, what, the two things you did were, were right on, apparently. Okay, <laughs> give, him, give him his reading now. Um, he's a little shy, but laid back, he's very neat and casual. Um, that's, that's all I have. Close. I'm, I'm not exactly very organized, so okay. I wouldn't exactly say neat. But yeah. What would you give her a rating if you had to give her a rating? Uh, um, 90%. 90%. Okay. Well, okay, <laughs> now, uh, let's then take one more. I'm not that then don't, I'm sorry. You had then again, I'm not that shy. You're not that shy, okay. <laughs> okay, so, so you had something you, 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 you didn't believe. That was a little bit off, maybe, okay. But that's okay, because shyness, you know, it, it's a funny thing. And, uh, there's, you're shy in some context, and shy not in others. Uh, okay. Uh, can I go first? I'm sorry, you can go first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Give me <clears throat> Um, I feel like you have a... You have an orderly background. Perhaps maybe parents were in law enforcement or military or something. Something to do with structure. Um, And I think now you've come to sort of rebel against that maybe. And you're coming into your own um, thinking in different ways and trying to figure out certain things. Um, what else? 
Um, but you feel a nervousness that you that you're not sure if 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 fitting if it's working. And um, yeah, but you you can be very uh, you're very confident and outgoing and strong at times. But maybe it's to um, to cover up for something. What would you give that? What kind of rating would you give that? Um, I mean, it was very vague and ambiguous. <laughs> but um, but you know what? Yeah. He was on the right track. Okay. You were. Right track. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Definitely. Sure. Okay. So, what kind of a rating or bad percentage would you give it? From zero um, to one hundred. Zero to one hundred. Yeah. Hundred being best. Right. I'll say seventy. Seventy percent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, now, now give him his reading. <laughs> I'm mad at you now. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I'm feeling an energy here. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, you, you know, you, you're so like, take me as you see me, man. I have no pretenses. I don't try to be something I'm not. You do hope that you do find people who finally see it. Especially girls, it's hard to find. Um, you're not confrontational, and you're really turned off by people who are. You're very sensitive. You do, um, and you do show it. No matter how much you cover it up, man, it 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 it, it betrays you. It comes out. Um, you're a gentle guy. You 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 don't. You're not very physical. Um, you know. You can lose a couple of pounds, but you also know you look good, and a lot of girls like you. <laughs> they just don't connect all the way. Mm -hmm. You have trust uh, issues. You're looking for a girl who's not very strong, not very masculine. Just someone who's just kind of stable and just loves you, no drama, drama free. Um, you're not driving exactly what you want to drive right now. Don't know why that's an issue. <laughs> <laughs> I was told that. <laughs> um, hmm. Let's see. I'm going to stop there. Okay. How did you do? Yeah, really good. There's How would you rate that on a scale from zero to 100? I'd say, um, give you, give 85. 85, okay. Yeah. That's the standard. That's the standard. That's, That's really the good. Standard. Now, yeah. if you got a reading, uh, how many would rate the reading that they got from their partner uh, f between 90 and 100? How many would do that? Uh, okay, so let me see if I got it right. One, two, three. The, who else? Did anyone else have a hand up? Okay, so three, three in this category. Okay, how many would rate it from uh, 80 to uh, 89? One, two, two there, okay. How many would rate it in the, from 70 to 79? One, two, three. I think I got everyone, okay. And, okay, 60 to 69. Okay, none. 50 to 59? None. Anything lower? I would say 50. What, what's that? You I, would, I would have said 50 to 59. Okay, so you would be that. So we got one there. Okay. And did I miss anyone? Well, I belong in the asterisk. What's that? I belong, I belong in the asterisk. Yes, you do. Because, because what she did was so obvious to me that what she said, it has a, a, an amazing duality to it, that it didn't apply and it did apply. So I'm having trouble even picking any of your numbers based on that. Oh, so you, you can't, you can't. Decide because you're. I really can't. But but but. I'm too much of a skeptic. I yeah, but even if you're, even as a skeptic, and regardless of whether you think it's general or not, the, 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 you sometimes you still can make a judgment as to, how, well, did, was something obviously wrong, or did it was something that seemed to fit, even though it's general. Then. If zero was an option, I would say it wasn't a reading. It was a uh, it was a generalization that. Uh, okay, so we'll I put an asterisk. Okay, so we grab an asterisk. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Now that's that's no reflection on you, Barbara. <laughs> Is it Barbara? Yeah. 
Okay. okay. No reflection on you. Uh, you, 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 you picked the loser. <laughs> okay. But you know, this is consistent with what I get. It's amazing, even here, it's, it's about 85 is what the meeting would be here. And it, it's, uh, over the, I, I first did a workshop in cold reading and did this, figured out to do this pairing thing in Oosten, um Belgium, it's on the North Shore on the thing. We had a conference, a World Skeptics Conference there. I think it was in the, in the early 80s or something like that. And uh, that's the first time I did it. And it was 85% right on. And ever since then, it's a magic number. 85% is what the average rating I get, and usually much larger groups. And with a TAM, 80, um, uh, 130 people, the average was right on 85%. So it, it's spooky, it's a magic number. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's much better than most psychics, do, much better than John Edwards. So you all people are pretty good. <laughs> and uh, even with a, uh, a dud, you know, you're probably you're pretty good. <laughs> well, statistically, that's what we should have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's the first time we've had an asterisk ever. In, uh, in 30 years, of my, well, what, the early 80s uh, to now is how many years? Uh, Almost 30. Enough to not yeah. remember. Okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so you do get, but actually, and most of the groups I, I do these workshops are, are, are turn out to be skeptical groups. Uh, and I got the same rating the way once I did it with a, um, but he was psychiatrists and other hospital attendants at the, uh, the uh, major, uh, um, uh, one big major uh, mental hospital in, in Oregon. Um, and uh, I did it for the, all the staff there. And I did a workshop on cold reading for them. And I think I still got 85%. So it doesn't make a difference whether the, for this kind of thing, whether they're skeptics or just other people. Did you ever do one with people who uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, actually believed in it? Psychics. Not, well, most people there. do, but I never had a group. Most, most, most of the workshops people ask me to do are by skeptics. And I always wonder about this. Why are skeptics so interested in learning how to do cold reading? And it's because they need an alternative fallback position to make a living, <laughs> I think. And that's, so I often wonder, maybe I shouldn't be teaching people how to do, be good at this because do we need more psychics out there? <laughs> I'm, I'm, my excuse is that this is fun, and it, it really, sh if you do it, it's really amazing how powerful it is, and you learn how it is, that you can do it, and people are just, and even skeptics sometimes are pretty much overwhelmed by it, but ordinary people, uh, they just love you, and they just, and it, it turns out that, uh, you know what, uh, you've heard of uh, T.A. Waters, haven't you, DJ? Yes. Okay, T.A. Waters was a, we're finished now. Uh, we have just a minute. Okay, T.A. Waters was a uh, well-known mentalist. He was at the Magic Castle and so on. He, he passed away. But um, he um, once wrote uh, one of his books, uh, classic books on mentalism. He wrote the story, he didn't name the people in the story. He said he wanted to show the power of, 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 of psychic readings. He said there was a party at someone's house, at a professor's house, in turn of the Percy Diaconis' house. He lived in San Francisco then. There was a party at his house, and a, one of the visitors was a well-known magician, and he did fantastic magic. And it, it was just amazing. But then the other person was asked to read palms and, 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 and then do a few of that, and he did those, and that was all the subject of conversation. And even weeks later, Percy was getting people coming back to him who had been at the party and talking about the palm reading. The point he wanted to make is that even the greatest magic won't outdo someone who just gives someone a reading. Because it, 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 it takes over. It turns out the two people at that party of Percy's was me, the, um, I did the palm reading, and Jerry Andrews, my good friend, and really one of the best magicians ever in the world, he could fool everyone. Uh, and yet his powerful magic, afterwards all he talked about and wanted to talk about in memory was in my palm reading. I did, I, I remember one of the guys was um, uh, one of Percy's uh, uh, colleagues at the uh, Department of Statistics in uh, uh, Stanford, and he's a man who was very famous for having developed a bootleg technique. You know, he was a very famous um, statistician, and he was the guy who actually had no doubts about it, that I hit everything on him and I couldn't have done it. 
other than abnormal needs. <laughs> next, uh, so next time we're going to get into the forer effect and get into the nitty gritty of how this really works, what, uh, what, what makes us work, <coughs> how it fits into psychology and how it fits into being a skeptic. So. <coughs>